Welcome. My name is Shamtoli Huck. I am the editor of Law at the Margins. For those who are not familiar, Law at the Margins is a law and media site where we amplify the voices and perspectives of communities and people who are marginalized in our system. Today, we're excited to have a webinar focused on the impact of coronavirus, COVID-19, on refugees, migrants, and other precarious immigrants. Before I hand the webinar over to uh, my colleague, Adam Carroll, who is with Justice for All, uh, let me just go over a little bit about how the webinar or our webinar sort of go. Um, we encourage you to uh, chat on our chat box, introduce yourself, add comments, add questions as you hear the speakers speak. What we have amongst our members and subscribers are fellow movement leaders. And so we know among you are experts as well. And our speakers begin the conversation, but we hope that you too will add in the chat box your expertise on this particular topic. This webinar will be on Facebook Live. You can share it on your uh, organizational page. Uh, we will also be tweeting um, the webinar using the hashtag, so, hashtag solidarity and survival. And thanks to our editor, Morgan Moon, for doing that. And if there are projects that you're working on, please let us know so we can boost your uh, work uh, in this area or in area areas around law and social justice. Um, so again, I welcome you all. And uh, with this introduction, I'm delighted to invite uh, Adam Carroll, who will introduce our phenomenal speakers who are really on the front lines of this work. And to moderate a conversation, we'll go for about um, 45 minutes. Then we will open up to Q&A, uh, ending uh, around sort of 1.30. Uh, thanks so much. And Adam, so just to take it away. can hear me. Um, I'm Adam Carroll. I'm the New, New York and UN uh, Program Director of Justice for All's uh, Burma Task Force Program. Uh, Justice for All is an NGO that um, arises out of earlier efforts on behalf of persecuted minorities, for example, in Bosnia and Kosovo. Um, and in 2012, um, established a program um, that I work with called Burma Task Force, um, advocating mainly on behalf of the Rohingya, Rohingya minority, but also in, uh, promoting solidarity among all the persecuted ethnic groups. Um, we also have other programs now, uh, because unfortunately this trend of persecution and marginalization is, 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 a, is spreading. Um, we have uh, Save uh, India, uh, Free Kashmir, Save Uyghur, uh, as programs as well. Um, so today, I mean, we're we're having a conversation at a moment of crisis. Uh, this uh, uh, we're all locked down. Uh, one, uh, mon ami Malik is in Geneva. Uh, Jan Jan uh, Maran is in uh, Virginia. Um, hopefully, uh, joining us from uh, Indiana or. Chicago. I'm not sure where she is today, but will be Sana Kutubuddin. Um, and we're all locked down in our separate places. I'm in Queens, New York, very hard hit. Um, uh, and uh, um, I see Sana has just joined us on text. Good. Um, and uh, hope to see you all in a moment as we join in a conversation about uh, some of those folks who are not uh, lucky to be able to quarantine at home. People who are uh, often homeless, that is the refugees and displaced people of the world. There's 71 million uh, of uh, these uh, people at least uh, throughout the world. And whether they're Rohingya or whether they're fleeing war in Syria or whether they're Palestinians in camps for generations, uh, this is a huge problem. Pro, uh, problem and many uh, of these uh, refugees and forced migrants, to use uh, an interesting term we'll discuss, uh, are uh, uh, living in crowded conditions, whether they're in cities, uh, sort of uh, underclass without very many rights, 
or whether they're uh, in uh, refugee camps uh, or IDP camps, displacement camps, um, they are at great risk for contagion because of lack of access to medical services and lack of um, uh, possibility of social distancing. So there could be millions dead um, in the matter of months from now. It's a major concern. So um, today we are going to have a conversation among uh, activists that I really respect and really I'm glad to join us. Um, first to go is Monami Malik. Um, she's the civil society liaison officer at the UN Network on Migration. Uh, I've known you uh, for over 15 years, and uh, I know you first as the founder of DRUM, Desi's Rising Up and Moving, uh, here in Queens, right in Jackson Heights, really the epicenter of the coronavirus impact here. Um, uh, also, I, I know you've launched other initiatives, South Asian Migrant Workers Alliance and many other uh, projects over the years. So, Monami, I was wondering if you could speak uh, about what you were working on uh, before and how it's changed since the arrival of this latest crisis, the health crisis. Adam. Um Okay, great. Um, thanks to Adam and Shamtholi, um, Law at the Margins, as well as um, uh, Justice for All, to um, the other speakers as well, Jan Jan and Sana, for organizing this very important discussion. At this time in the world, uh, when everything is in flux, and particularly when we think about some of the most marginalized communities in our societies, and migrants and refugees, and in general, people on the move, being one of the most vulnerable in our societies and, and across borders. Uh, I work for the UN Network on Migration, which was only established uh, about a year and a half ago, in early 2019, after most governments around the world signed the Global Compact for Safe, Regular, and Orderly Migration. Uh, the Global Compact for Migration was negotiated for the the three years preceding that amongst governments in a UN-led process, at the same time that governments were also negotiating and eventually adopted a global compact on refugees. And I just wanna say at the outset, um, in, international, in the international legal framework and in terms of the UN system and governance of the issues and rights of refugees and migrants, these are things, they are categories of people that are very much separated because of international law. However, I think uh, many people, of course, that work with people on the move, people in civil society, myself as a migrant and refugee organizer for years, um, and even in the way in the UN network we look at it is that people can be categorized as migrants or as refugees in different parts of their journey in different countries in different ways, but the impacts, the conditions, uh, whether they're labeled migrant or refugee is, uh, is very similar. And the dangers that they face at the moment and um, the conditions they face are, are very similar. Um, so the UN Network on Migration just a few months ago before all of this really came on was looking to help migrants, migrant organizations, NGOs, civil society groups, and governments around the world who have signed and adopted the Global Compact on Migration to implement the objectives of the compact. The compact covers a 360 degree approach to migration, everything from issues of development uh, and climate change and push factors that uh, push people to migrate across borders uh, but also into issues of the process of migration and the journey, border controls, returns, detention, um, the questions of when migrants arrive in destination countries, of uh, inclusion, of access to services, of labor rights, and then also questions again of, of returns um, that have, you know, is a critical issue of, of migrants, returns meaning deportations. So the compact encompassed all of this and we were working to support the, the reality of some of the aspects of the compact on the ground for migrants. 
And what this current COVID-19 pandemic has done is of course, in a bigger picture, um, forced us all and is already uh, being sort of utilized in some places and in some countries uh, as a way to uh, of course, restrict borders. So we're seeing all across the world an immediate closure of borders that has grave impl implications, both in the immediate short term for those people who are waiting on, uh, on one side of that border, who are trying to put in asylum claims but are being turned away, who are immediately being turned away. Um, and also has implications, obviously, for the whole conception of human mobility and migration in the longer term perspective. So it's a very critical time for all of us. And I think we're all still learning as this evolves and evolves in different regions of the world, first in the global north, that tended to be known as the migrant receiving countries. But now we're going to see how the, the pandemic and the virus impacts in developing and poorer countries and in the global south, which are considered the migrant sending countries. But I just want to say that, that that dichotomy is not exactly accurate in that nearly half of all migration in the world is inter-regional. Inter so migration within Africa, migration within Asia, migration within Latin America, not necessarily always to Europe or North America or Australia. Um, so given uh, this, um, what the UN network has been doing is uh, talking to our civil society, NGO, trade union, <clears throat> migrant organization colleagues around the world in the last couple of weeks to hear from them about what the impacts are, what initiatives and activities they're trying to do, where are their positive and also uh, harmful policies being put in place, um, and how can we target some of the issues for advocacy moving forwards. Um, so what we've been doing is um, holding a series of listening sessions with stakeholders, and stakeholders meaning civil society organizations, faith-based organizations, trade unions, national human rights institutes, migrant-led organizations, diaspora groups, and others. And the purpose of the listening session is just to hear across regions, across countries, what the impacts are that that people are seeing on the ground and to hear from people at the ground level who are working in local cities or at borders or in other local levels. Um, and I will summarize some of the outcomes that we've heard from these listening sessions. And then I'll say a little bit about what the plan is for global advocacy agenda alongside the UN Network on Migration and, and most of the UN agencies uh, to move forward and address some of the key advocacy issues and prop crises that migrants and refugees, but predominantly migrants, are facing. Um, so, and just to back up a little bit and say the UN Network on Migration itself is a network of uh, a number of UN agencies, uh, and our executive committee consists of eight UN agencies, uh, which includes the International Organization on Migration. Um, the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the Office of the High Commissioner on Refugees, uh, and several others. And other UN agencies like the World Health Organization are part of the network as well, and now are working very closely in, in developing guidance and policy briefs to governments on the protection of rights for migrants. Um, so we held these two listening sessions a few weeks ago and they were, they were joined by uh, about 200 organizations and people from around the world, from uh, dozens of countries and I think every single region of the world. And we heard many, many stories from advocates, migrant organizers, migrant leaders themselves about the key areas of impact that people are seeing on, on the ground in the short term and the long term. And I'll categorize them, and there's so many, in three areas. One is the economic and social rights um, and, and the dangers to economic and social rights for migrants and people on the move and refugees at the time. Um, and in, in that sense, of course, it's what we've been hearing 
uh, a lot in the media as well, uh, the, the reality that migrants are both some of the most at risk are now being recognized as frontline and essential workers, putting them more at risk, but also already those who were marginalized and excluded in societies from healthcare, access to basic services, of social protections, of workers' benefits, um, and now are finding themselves excluded from government relief packages for pandemic relief, and particularly in terms of income uh, support and uh, access to other services. And just to say, this is not only the case for undocumented migrants, certainly undocumented migrants in most countries are, ex are excluded from these relief packages and services, but even documented migrants in, in many places are. Um, so we're hearing severe challenges faced by, uh, with regards to access to services and basic livelihoods, health services, food, housing, and access to information even. Um, the safety nets of governments don't apply to migrants and people seeking asylum. Um, throughout the world, undocumented migrants are not included in government security measures, particularly emergency assistance, such as in housing shelters and unemployment benefits. And in the current time, there is a, a, a very strong reliance on civil society organizations, on NGOs and the non-governmental sector to fill the gap that governments are, are not filling at the time. And so we want to lift up a voice and platform through the UN Network on Migration for the work that these NGOs are doing and at the same time support their advocacy to include migrants in the government relief packages. A second area we heard of concern is increase in gender-based violence um, that particularly migrant women may be facing in close quarters in certain living conditions and shelters in situations at the border that are even more pronounced now. Uh, and of course, situations of stigmatization and xenophobia. And the reality that COVID-19 ex is exacerbating the underlying economic and social inequalities that have long faced migrants and, and people on the move. The second area of, of uh, impact is uh, also short but has longer term implications. And this is what I was mentioning, the global closures of borders. So in shelters near borders, um, many organizations are reporting the very quick loss of resources and staff because of social distancing measures and, and, uh, and isolation and quarantine. Uh, asylum seekers in many places are not getting appointments or appointments have been canceled or being turned away at the border without screenings. Uh, shelters are being closed to new migrants that are coming in. Uh, there's a strong need, of course, to, to prevent the disease from reaching shelters, facilities, and camps where migrants are housed in overcrowded situations. And closures of borders is also increasing the risk of, infinite, of indefinite detention and immediate deportation. In a few cases, uh, there have been instances of immediate release. And so I know Spain has had the release of some migrants. Mexico, uh, judges in Mexico just uh, ruled a few days ago about for the release of children in detention, as well as those at risk, older or who are already immunocompromised from detention. So those are good examples, uh, but there's a long way to go in other countries. Uh, and then we're also seeing the sort of mass deportation of um, temporary migrant workers, particularly from the Gulf states. Um, and a lot of these migrants tend to be South Asian or Southeast Asian. And so we're seeing sort of uh, large deportation programs. And the last area I'll talk about is political landscapes and the civil and civil and political rights that are being affected. Um, and so COVID-19 is, is certainly being used to further some nationalist and xenophobic rhetoric and agendas in certain countries. Um, civil society organizations, as well as those who are human rights defenders of migrants, including migrants themselves, are reporting some increased concerns of risk of their criminalization of their activities. Because you can understand if organ NGOs or civil society groups are closing the offices, activists are working from their homes and there's questions of data and privacy, particularly in places that 
already had um, low levels of safety for activists to defend the rights of migrants. Um, we're also seeing that um, the, you know, of course, a lot of report on xenophobic attacks and discrimination against migrants, but it's not only, I mean, of course, it's a, uh, Asian migrants were one of the first to face this, particularly say in, in North America. We're also seeing various groups of migrants being targeted as foreigners carrying in the disease in different regions. So uh, most recently in Africa, there was a huge wage of, uh, a wave of evictions and attempted expulsions of African migrants, sorry, in China. Uh, evictions and targeting of African migrants and foreigners in general. Um, so these are some of the, the stories we've heard. I, so before I wrap up, I just want to say that the, the UN network will continue to hold listening sessions and I encourage and invite everyone uh, in this webinar to join and I'll, I'll pass along my information if you'd like to register. In the future, we're going to thematically focus these listening sessions uh, and the first few we have next week on Thursday, we'll hold the first listening session on access to services, which will be co-led by the World Health Organization. Uh, but it's mainly to hear from groups on the ground, from non-governmental actors. The, one, the week preceding on May 7th will be on alternatives to detention. And then we have some others lined up, including um, the gender impacts of COVID-19, uh, as well as the impacts on returns and deportation. So I'd be happy to share more of that information. And the idea out of the listening session is to help to channel and prioritize the work of the UN and multiple agencies and the UN in a better way in the coming weeks and months in a way that's informed by all of you, by people on the ground. And after each listening session, the working groups within the UN network that work on each of these specific topics such as alternatives to detention, access to services, will take information that we've heard from the listening sessions and develop policy briefs for governments making recommendations on some of those issues. Uh, and then those policy briefs will launch with a series of webinars, which you'd be invited to as well, to hear how you can use those policy briefs in your countries to advocate for the inclusion and better rights and protections of migrants. So I'll stop there and, and thank you. Thanks, Mon Ami. And um, before we go uh, to speak with Jan Jan, um, I wanted to uh, uh, just do one follow-up question with you. Um, you mentioned the, the, the role of civil society and uh, you know, we know that in the international community, not only are there some vast bureaucracies, but there's uh, nation states with various uh, agendas, and they are sometimes, uh, you know, riding this uh, uh, crisis as uh, a kind of vehicle for um, repression or um, to uh, just power politics. So we see this as very imp imperfect, but in terms of building the relationship between civil society and uh, uh, the nation states, the member nations of the UN. Um, how do you see that going? Um, what needs to be done in terms of um, building relationships of trust? Are there ways to improve access to PPE, the personal protection, you know, equipment and the various, uh, I mean, there are places where none of these um, refugees or displaced people have any access to ventilators. Um, and so there's there's uh, huge disparities. Um, the international humanitarian organizations in some cases don't have access to protection uh, equipment. And so they've withdrawn to some extent. So I was just wondering how you see this, this uh, relationship with the governments and uh, what can be done in the near term. Uh, to Monami. Yes, so just unmuting myself. Um, that's a great question. And I think part of the reason we're holding these listening sessions is to build some of those linkages in, say, in situations where particular NGOs, civil society groups on the ground are not getting access to the UN agencies at, in that country, um, the, the agencies that would be working in, sh in shelters or camps or in cities. 
Uh, and so the, the listening sessions are actually also joined by a number of UN agencies. And we've been doing an intentional outreach to make sure it's not just the Geneva-based representatives, but it's country-based representatives who are on these listening sessions, listening to NGOs and civil society, sometimes within their own country, that otherwise perhaps they're, they're not speaking to each other. Um, so part of the, the, the intention of the listening sessions is to build that voice and connection. And what happened after the last listening sessions is some of that precisely. Um, organizations that wanted to ask these hard questions of the UN agencies in their country found them on the call and then and, and, and it allowed them to work together further, whether it's about access to PPE in shelters and camps or um, the questions of detention or seeing where agencies are at the country level, what they're responding to, what their priorities should be. Um, so we hope to do that further. And also I, I welcome those who, who have those questions or dilemmas to uh, contact me and the UN network to help facilitate some of those relationships uh, to be able to advocate in your country levels. So um, before we do a conversation, we're gonna switch over to John John Moran, who's a Kachin uh, activist, a Kachin American, uh, working uh, here in the US. Um, we hope that Sana Uddin will be able to join us. I know she's on the text, but uh, she seems to be having some issues with connectivity. Um, but uh, anyway, I'm happy to have Jan Jan on um, because um, you know you've worked with Stand uh, with a student uh, anti-genocide campaign. Uh, you've worked to build uh, solidarity among di different ethnic groups here, and uh, you're a student at uh, at George uh, at uh, George Mason uh, on in global affairs and environmental sustainable studies. So those are certainly relevant. Um, you know, there's a link between uh, environmental uh, exploitation in Burma, for example, and the displacement of the ethnic communities there and the military abuses. So um, certainly um, these are important. But I wanted to start with a question, Jan Jan, about the Burmese diaspora here and elsewhere in the world. Um, what are you hearing? How are they affected by the current crisis? I mean, this talk for some of um, to answer your question, um, from what I know so far, um, just, you know, as a person who's part of like the Burmese American community here in America, um, I don't really know that a lot of people are affected by this um, epidemic, except for maybe like in the beginning, people were not as aware about what was happening. And um, they, yeah, they were mostly worried and scared about, you know, what was going on because this is like something new. And um, I'm pretty sure there's a lot of like, you know, fear and just confusion in general in the beginning. And I remember you, Adam, like reaching out to me to ask, um, you know, the community if like they really needed any help, like with their church or anything, like, you know, just like for people to come in and um, just educate them about what's going on with the pandemic um, so yeah I guess um, within my own community here in DC I go to a church um, it's Calvary Burmese Church in DC um, we've been meeting up virtually so we're blessed to be able to do that however we do understand that not all the um, people in the Burmese American community uh, within here um, are able to do that um, so uh, I think it's fair to say that like all Burmese communities within America are actually different from one another. So you know, um, while we're uh, we seem to be a little bit more um, more independent here in DC since we've had people who came over from Burma like years ago, there's still like communities within here in America, like in other places such as Indiana or Buffalo, New York, where like refugees are still coming in. You know, and like they're recently fairly new, so um, they don't they might not know how to be able to. Um, you know, uh, just like handle the technology or just even be able to learn, like, you know, and um, just go along with like taking precautions as quickly. So um, there is definitely a gap even within the Burmese community about how, you know, things are just um, addressed and how they're like, you know, moving forward with. So um, to be like, you know, going back on a bigger scale in worldwide me measures, um, like, you know, just going back to like, 
places like Australia or like even other places within Asia, like in Japan or, you know, like Burmese people living in those communities out there, even in like first world countries or developed nations. Um, I think, you know, they're they're doing the best they can as well. Like I've even seen on social media, like, you know, there's they're tackling this through like just um, sharing songs, even like people are just getting creative with it and like making songs about like how to wash your hands with, um, you know, to deal with coronavirus and stuff like that. And um, it's been pretty interesting to see how like the Burmese diaspora community overall has been like tackling this issue. Um, regarding the migrants and refugees, though, um, in within Burma, um, I do know that, you know, like just like um, Mona Mee mentioned, um, there are a lot of terrible conditions that are, you know, just going on in there where um, you have to live nearby each other. Um, there's they don't have the luxury to be able to social distance like we do here in the States or elsewhere in developed countries. Um, when I went there um, in two years ago, like 2018, I remember um, just being astounded at the sight of like all of their their living quarters you know being so tight-knit and close um it's basically like the size of my room i could say like for an entire household of like maybe five or six people and um there's, there's just not enough space they don't live in regular houses like you and i do here in the united states and i'm pretty sure a lot of people here know that but um just coming to reality with that like seeing that firsthand um with my own eyes really like you know told me the message that you know this this is just like it's not something that should be normalized you know and it's something that a lot of people um with privileges like us here in the united states should be paying attention to and should be advocating more on uh, let me see is it's on thank you um so John, John, uh, just to follow up, um, I mean, I appreciate you started um, talking about uh, what uh, communities are doing for themselves and for others uh, and their resilience. It's not only that refugees are victims and it's, it's very important to talk about impacted communities as partners and as agents of their own um, help, but resources are always a problem. And, and uh, um, so um, as far as, um, uh building uh alliances um whether it's with students working against genocide or it's ethnic leaders uh who have to build uh trust with other ethnic groups um what do you see going forward as some special uh things uh action steps that you you want to take Great question. Thank you so much for asking me that. Um, some action steps that I do see for the future is um, the power of students. So, you know, being part of STAN, the student led movement to end a genocide and mass atrocities, I really do strongly believe that students have the power like to enact change because although we are you know still people who are just reading from books and like you know taking tests and quizzes, we are still very um, youthful and we have a lot of energy and we're active so um just taking in this energy and like knowing how to organize people around this issue is something that i am really um, trying for right now um so even recently i can give an example like i've been reaching out to a lot of my peers um within the burmese diaspora communities to start to you know care a little bit more about this issue because um something that often occurs within um, our generation is that we, we're like first generation students so we have a lot of our own struggles as well and like to be thinking about other struggles happening within our own you know home communities it's a little bit tough to deal with because it's like another added pressure but despite that um, I feel like you know during this quarantine time it's especially opportune to be like working on these kind of issues because you're at home now like you know and a lot of the campaign actions that we do with stan it's all mostly online so it's very doable and um yeah i've just been messaging a lot of people recently and they've been coming back to me um telling me whether they're interested or not interested and i've just been explaining about what stan is like um to even my own fellow kitchen american friends um who live like you know around the states and um yeah like um, going back to your question, um, just like building solidarity with other ethnic groups, um, I'm also trying to uh, reach out to my Karen friends and um, yeah, just like other friends that I have who are maybe Burmese too or just not Kachin either, you know, and um, 
the thing with uh, advocating on like issues that deal with other ethnic groups is also something that's tough as well because um, while you do have your own issues that are going on within your own like Kachin or Karen or you know Shan or Chin communities, um, it's 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 like very time consuming to also think about the you know atrocities that are occurring in other places. But um, the thing that I really do like about being part of STAND is that we're still able to focus on all of these issues at the same time. Um, so yeah, like I think building that solidarity between other people is definitely crucial to moving forward. Um, and I'm seeking to do that currently. So I'm looking forward to doing that as well. As adults, however, um, I know that adults are a little bit like wary of working into the advocacy field because you know they already have a history um, having been living in, you know, Burma and like some of them have even, my father, for example, has even like uh, been part of a protest back in Burma and um, he nearly got an arrow like thrown at his um, uh, leg while he was there. But, um, you know, thankfully he was out of there safely. Um, but, you know, just instances like that kind of like scar them as well. So that's kind of like some psychological trauma and like that's something that they don't really want to ever revisit. So um, I do realize that this is actually like a privilege that we first generation students do have. Um, who've been born in the United States and never been back to Burma, but still do care about Burma issues. And so we have that, um, that like, you know, brave or courageous attitude to just tackle it because we've never really experienced harm from the Burmese government themselves. So yeah, like there's that. And um, I guess that's pretty much all I have to say for that question. Okay. Um Actually, I think I saw Sana a minute ago and then she just vanished. So we'll hope she's going to uh, try again. Um, but Jan, Jan uh, a follow up then. Um, uh, as far as, um, uh, well, I mean, we're, we're looking at, at the power of student activism um, and overcoming the division that the Burmese military in this case has created among the ethnic groups. Um, and the Burmese military has refused to adopt a ceasefire despite the UN Secretary General's global call for, uh, for a ceasefire in all conf conflict areas. Uh, so the uh, ethnic militias generally have said that they would stand down and despite that, we're seeing bombing in Chin State just in the last day or two, and, and various other uh, military abuses going on. Um, so it's, uh, uh, how would you say these military abuses are linked to environmental uh, exploitation in Burma? That's a great question. Um, so I'm pretty sure a lot of you guys are familiar with how the Burmese military has um, profited off of like the jade and like you know just like diamond industries in burma um so that goes with environmental degradation because you know they're creating these mines where like they dig up the jewelry you know like the, the minerals and stuff um and along with that um there has been talks about you know creating like a, a chinese railway into burma where like the rakhine state is where the rohingya were fled out of um or where you know chewed out of I don't know a better word for that, sorry. Um, but yeah, um, it, and it just kind of shows, it relates very uh, directly with these conflicts that we see because um, with that railroad that they're trying to build, um, we hear of talks that China is trying to gain control of like the South China Sea. So this is um, their plan, like to build a direct, you know, transportation route from China to Burma, where the Rakhine state is, where all that Rohingya issue occurred, and even right now is occurring. Um, 15 people have passed away just last Monday. Um, and there, it's just a lot of fear, you know, going on with people fleeing that area, even now trying to cross the border to Bangladesh, but having problems because the borders are closed, just like um, Amonami mentioned. Um, and yeah, it's just, um, it's really terrible. Um, and so you have that going on in Rakhine State. And then you also have like in Kachin State, um, another conflict going on with like the Mitsong Dam, which I am really angry about actually, because um, it the, the Irrawaddy River is such a beautiful, like natural, you know, source uh, within the entire country. It links every part of the country together. And it's like an uh, important part of trade where like, you know, everyone can just like, um, uh, transport things to each other and not only that but like it really um, fertilizes the soil that comes from 
uh, the, the soil that's in the southern part of the country because the river travels from the north to the south. And if you're blocking that with a dam, um, you know, all the sand and silt that's going to be coming from the north and that travels normally to the south won't be like going there anymore. It's going to be blocked. And so then you have like the issue or like the threat of um, agriculture, like just failing in the southern part of the country because um, it's not going to be getting all the nutrients that it needs. And so there's also, um, you know, like the, the threat of um, what's it called? Famine and like, you know, just no more food um, for the people in the south. It's just going to destroy the economy and um, it's going to destroy the livelihoods of the people that are in the entire country. And um, with the kitchen people themselves, like they're really against this dam. And um, currently it is, um, what's it called? Like it's, it's not like ongoing right now. They've paused it for a while. Um, but basically this dam is um, a project that was, um, you know, just brought up by the Chinese. Um, so China is planning to build this dam and, and, and it's to generate electricity, not only, not, not just for like, not even for Burmese citizens, it's going to be all for Chinese citizens. And it's going to be for like these Chinese citizens who are living in huge houses that are like um, built near that dam. And so apparently like I have some relatives who have been up there in the Michina area where the dam is. And they say that there's uh, basically these, um, a whole neighborhood of like huge mansions that are built near this dam. And it's kind of hidden behind a hill so that no one can see it, not even Burmese citizens themselves. So it's kind of like, you know, it's, it's just like not, out there it's really hidden and um it's, it's just crazy how like they're suddenly imposing these dams and like you know they're they're having a lot of economic interests in the country um all just to profit their own country without even giving any share to the burmese people at all so yeah and there's also a banana plantations going on in kachin state where like there's also concerns for that because there's Chinese laborers still coming into the country. I'm not sure if they've halted that right now, but I know that the last time since I read um, from articles, they're still um, crossing borders, like nothing's happening. And um, they the banana plantations also use chemicals. So there's also environmental degradation going on with that. And just basically the, um, how would you say it? I'm not that well-versed in English, so sorry. But um, it, it's basically just the, taking advantage of like the ethnic minorities in the country and the Burmese military working along with that so they can profit from the Chinese. Okay, now I see Sana is on the line. She, her, her image keeps coming up and on, but I see your, uh, your screen. Sana, can you speak? Let's see, I see your screen and we don't hear anything. We're waiting for you to connect. Looks like maybe not. All right, she keeps trying to come in and it's unfortunate. Maybe it's a moment just to say that Sana Akutubuddin uh, is a long time activist working with Muslim NGOs in India. And the, the, the impact of, of COVID in India is both uh, the potential of um, the disease to spread in a huge, very crowded population, but also the government policies, on one hand, with four hours notice, decreeing that um, a lockdown, which um, uh, created an exodus of millions of people to their hometowns uh, where they, because they couldn't have lived otherwise, there was, um, they had no income. And so um, they had to go back to the farms and the small villages and those crowds probably spread the contagion even more. Um, but then another aspect of the crisis in India is with the uh, policies of the Modi government um, promoting division among the ethnic groups, uh, there's been a rise in xenophobia. You know, there's been lynchings, uh, uh, all kinds of, of anti-Muslim uh, laws passed. Um, and unfortunately, I thought uh, Sana was going to be speaking about that, but it's it's all being made much worse by this health crisis. And uh, we hear many reports about hospitals um, segregating Muslim patients from Hindu patients. Um, it's really it eroded um, the uh, democratic fabric that you know uh, India was once. Um, praised as the world's largest democracy. 
Um, and uh, again, I see Sana's uh, uh, image here. Are you there? Are you on mute? Yes. I oh, can you oh, hear good. me? Yeah. Yes, can please go ahead. Yes. Yay. Yes. Can you <laughs> I can hear everybody. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I'm in the middle of nowhere, literally. And, um, and so my connection hasn't been great. But yes, the, um, the crisis within India is certainly one of, um, of grave international concern. Um, recently, we had, as you mentioned, um, Adam, the lockdown the nation was shut in the largest migration in the So um, that is us to, um, we know right now hundreds of deaths um, from starvation and um, the journeys that people are trying to go back to their, their villages. Um, it been an extraordinary humanitarian catastrophe, that migration and the ill-planned lockdown and what that has led to for the migrant workers all throughout India. Um, I think what's really challenging right now is um, that the pain and the suffering uh, faced by the migrants because of this shutdown has not been um, acknowledged by the government um, and a lot of the complicit news media. Um, the news media that's not complicit uh, with the um, Modi uh, party and the Modi regime, I should say, um, they have been reporting uh, more accurately about the extraordinary humanitarian, uh, humanitarian crisis uh, that's unfolding with um, the continued uh, migration Integration. Um, I mean, it's uh, it's it's been horrendous, and the exact toll of um, what that has led to um, has not been um, adequately um, understood yet. Um, and the human rights activists and workers and organizers that are trying to assess that have um, have faced many obstacles. Um, uh, because of um, the BJP party um, really clamping down on activists and organizers throughout India. And um, what's really concerning is that um, much of the migrant uh, uh, workers throughout India are from India's lowest castes and India's Muslims. And, um, and, and India's Muslims 90% of our ancestry comes from the lowest caste. So there's this compounded identity there. Um, so a majority of these, uh, the migrant workers are, um, are in this uh, situation where, um, you know, they're having to deal with COVID, inadequate support system, they're suffering not being acknowledged. In addition to, to what's happening to the entire migrant population is the um, this propaganda, this idea that um, it was Muslims that were exclusively responsible for the spread of COVID throughout India. And this has, has led to very dangerous impacts on the lives of Muslims throughout India. Um, so the there was a uh, Muslim missionary gathering in Delhi in the first week of March. And, um, and it's really important for people to understand that um, the government, uh, the ruling party, they went and they directed their testing efforts at a time where there are not many tests being con conducted consistently across India. The overwhelming focus of the testing efforts and disproportionate testing was done to Tablighi Jamaat members, that is the Muslim uh, missionary group that had a large convening in, in Delhi. And, and nobody is denying the fact that um, it wasn't um, wise of them to hold that. Um, and at the same time, the government had begun 
already in other places to uh, you know raise alarm in certain respects, but they had already started other mass gatherings that were simultaneously happening alongside this one. But um, the the testing and the numbers of the testing of the Jamath event and uh, compared to um, all cases has skewed the understanding of uh, you know sort of like which communities that this came from and and you know this is a humanitarian crisis and it shouldn't be um, a community that's bl blamed for these issues unfortunately that is the case and at the same time we also want to make sure that people understand that the way these tests were carried out has skewed the numbers um, and understanding of the issue which has led to the deaths of so many um, Muslims throughout India, because of that association, you had a government uh, BJP official, uh, the Minister of Minority Affairs, Abbas Nakvi, who um, who basically said that you know that the Bligi Jamaat event was a terrorist event, was a Talibani event, and so this was coming from the ruling party. This was coming from a BJP minister, and then uh, journalists that are um, essentially, um, you know, very much colluded with the government, were spouting the same ideas, and um, this has led to mass hysteria and about Muslims. And there is not a single part of India, whether it's a uh, BJ, BJP-led state or a non-BJP-led state, where besides Kerala, I must clarify, besides Kerala, where this mass hysteria about Muslims um, has has not sort of consumed society. Um, my mother is from a um, a town called Karimnagar, which is a a small town um, uh, and in in southern India. And my cousin was denied um, access to medical care at three hospitals in Karimnagar, and she was told over and over again that she uh, was they wouldn't give her uh, medical care because she's Muslim. And so um, she was privileged enough that she was able to, um, you know, leave the city to um, receive treatment at a small town nearby where a Muslim uh, woman that was a physician um, risked her, um, you know, her employment by taking in my cousin. Um, and as she was taking in my cousin, she was being told, you shouldn't be taking her. Um, she's a Muslim. They're spreading this disease. Um, so, um, I mean, the repercussions are tremendous. Um, this is just uh, what happened to my cousin. But um, yesterday, a woman in the northern state of Charkhan, um, her baby ended up dying um, from uh, because when she was um, entering the hospital, she was bleeding, and the um, hospital said that you can't enter here because you're a Muslim. And she said, "Please help me." And and they said, "Well, you have to wipe up all of your blood if you, you know, if you are to be admitted." As she was wiping up her blood, she she had her baby. Her baby ended up dying. Um, and these are only the reports. Another friend, another, another two friends of mine. In the United States, have both had relatives uh, denied access to medical treatment, um, and uh, one of their relatives ended up dying um, because he didn't receive kidney dialysis. And why I'm saying that you know I have friends here that have had relatives there is because there are not being first information reports, police reports are not um, being, um, you know, these instances and these situations are not being reported in the numbers that they should be reported because there is a lot of fear Indian Muslims have, um, in reporting these cases because of the Citizenship Amendment Act, which essentially declared India's Muslims stateless on December, uh, 13th, 2019. Um, the Citizenship Amendment Act, for those of you that don't uh, aren't aware, um, it uh, essentially allows for people that are every other community besides Muslims from neighboring com countries except Myanmar and Sri Lanka um, to have access to full citizenship within India. 
And this, um, in combination with the National Registration of Citizens list, um, basically, uh, and the National Registration, sorry, the National Registration of Citizens list is a process where um, Indian citizens uh, provide documentation uh, to uh, indicate their, you know, to show that they're citizens and all that, this process is highly compromised um, from my friend who's a human rights lawyer in the state of Assam um, has documented that the contractors at these tribunals where citizenship is determined in this national registration of citizens process, the BJP contractors, the, sorry, the contractors that um, have declared the most number of people to be non-citizens that are Muslim have had their contracts renewed. And the, the contractors that have declared the um, least number of, uh, you know, who have declared the least number of Muslims um, as citizens, they have had, uh, sorry, yeah, they've had their contracts renewed and the people that declared uh, Muslims as non-citizens they've had their contracts terminated. And, um, and he's provide documentation about this highly compromised process of, um, you know, uh, proving somebody's citizenship. Um, to complicate things further, um, over 50% uh, of India's Muslim population cannot read and um, are also amongst, are the most destitute communities socioeconomically and in the realms of education and, and social mobility. So all of these compounding factors um, make it very difficult for Muslims to provide the adequate documentation to provide, you know, to show that they um, are, are from India. Um, and so um, this whole process of the CAA and RC process that has led to um, Indian Muslims essentially being declared stateless. Um, so when you go through the NRC process, essentially, um, as long as you're not Muslim and you uh, have, you don't have that, say you, say you don't have the adequate documentation to provide uh, these tribunals and, um, but you're Hindu or you're Parsi or you're Jain or you're Sikh or you're Christian, um, this CAA loophole, Citizenship Amendment Act loophole, will then provide you citizenship. But if you're not, if you're Muslim, then you won't have citizenship. And there are detention centers all throughout India um, being built. But Assam in particular has had this situation. Um, this situation has been going on for the last 30 years. Um, and the situation is... Um, about uh, both ethno-nationalism and uh, Hindu nationalism. Um, uh, and it's um, unfortunate, an unfortunate situation. Um, the ethnic tensions within Assam in particular, um, they are remnants of the colonial era where uh, there was a um, there was a tension that was created amongst these communities that have historically ethnic communities of Assamese and Bengali communities, uh, ethnic groups that have historically lived together. And um, under the colonial era, um, there was a small group of people that were, um, that had um, been somewhat favored by uh, the uh, the colonial forces, the British colonial forces, and um, and this led to a, a sentiment that um, that Bengali culture and language was more appreciated uh, by the British, and that and this this led to a sentiment amongst the Assamese community that their culture and their identity was not as accepted. And so, uh, Sana, yes. um, I wanted Sorry. to interject. Um, I don't know if I got off track. No, no, topic, that's very, very helpful. In fact, it reminds me of uh, the impact of, of British colonialism in Burma as well, um, where um, there's a perceived 
there was a perceived favoritism um, uh, that is being used now and has been used by the Burman uh, majority, uh, a kind of politics of resentment, um, saying, oh, they were brought in and they don't belong here. They Now it's time to even the score. We should be in, in Burma a, a Burman Buddhist nation and everyone else is second class citizen, if that, uh, not even citizen. Um, so this system of disenfranchisement is going on, unfortunately, uh, using the pretext, we could say, of, of colonial domination, but really distorting the history in many ways as well. And in India, you've described really well uh, how the current uh, Mo Modi regime uh, is uh, unfortunately uh, dividing the uh, communities in a really uh, extreme way now. And, uh, and so, uh, and you've described also the impact on some particular family members and friends uh, and, and this is uh, happening at a vast scale. Um, I wanted to open up the conversation with Monami and also Jan Jan to comment. Um, and Monami, um, I was wondering if you had any particular comment. You're from Kolkata um, and uh, um, you've probably uh, viewed this, um, this, these trends for many years. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add in? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think in, if you mean in terms of the, what was just talked about in South Asia and in India in particular, uh, absolutely, I think Sana gave such a comprehensive uh, historical background to the current situation. But uh, I just shared in the chat some of the, um, some relevant uh, resources and documents from the perspectives of the UN, and I shared um, uh, one was a, uh, statement by the Special Rapporteur on uh, racism, xenophobia, and all forms of discrimination, Tendai Achiyume, uh, who's been tracking and monitoring the, 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 you know, the COVID-19 sort of pandemic uh, the related escalations of racism and xenophobic attacks, as Sana mentioned in the Indian context, um, and then in other countries as well. Uh, and then also uh, the UN High Commissioner on Human Rights did make a statement around the situation of migrant workers in India. And one of the, I think it's been described as one of the largest, uh, very immediate mass reverse migrations in recent history. What happens? What happened when millions of migrant workers fled, uh, tried to flee to the countryside after the lockdown? Uh, was announced in such a short time frame. Um, and I think uh, the, the condition of internal migrants and, and internally displaced people is such a, a huge phenomenon in itself that encompasses such a broader scope of hundreds of millions of people who are not cov covered in these discussions on cross-border migration and refugees. Uh, and it's also a diff in some ways a more difficult issue to advocate in terms of a global solidarity movement or um, even multilateral sort of initiatives like the UN network and agreements that governments sign with each other about cross-border migration because even prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, the discourse on migration globally has been completely, is very much dominated by um, the national sovereignty, sovereignty of states. Um, and so the Global Compact on Migration was negotiated in a very hostile and tricky environment over three years. It's quite, in some ways, quite miraculous that governments in this time period agreed to a compact on migration that actually has quite a few positive uh, perspectives about the protection of rights and benefits for migrants and people on the move. Um, but just in terms of Calcutta, I'll just say I was there a few months ago and I, Got, I, I, I got to see a little bit just firsthand the implications of what Sana described of the, of the CAA policy and what, you know, in effect turned um, Muslims who've been living, who are, you know, Indians, into um, stateless people. 
um, I, I was in the Calcutta Municipal Corporation trying to get a copy of my birth certificate. Uh, and I went there over a couple of days to do it. And I, I literally saw hundreds of families, thousands over the course of a few days in line from four o'clock in the morning uh, till, till late at night and crowding a room and being treated quite inhumanely and disrespectfully because they were trying to get their birth certificates and, and documentation before this deadline, which I think was supposed to have been in April at some point. Um, and certainly the the um, stoking of anti-Muslim sentiment that has already been in place with um, in the current conditions and um, administration has just fueled uh, in, in increased increasingly and and. This is the case, sadly, I think in a lot of countries where there's been already a toxic discussion about migrants and particular groups of, uh, not migrants, but minorities, uh, uh, ethnic minorities, religious, cultural minorities, and uh, sort of conflated with migrants. And now I think a, a bigger sort of, you know, in 20 years ago after 9-11, there was a national security paradigm of looking at others, whether the others were actually foreigners or perceived to be foreigners, even if they've been in, in the nation state for generations. I think we're gonna see another period that's similar to a post 9-11 period, but the new paradigm is gonna be about the utilization of the argument of health and public health. Uh, and I think the ways in which this is going to further certain xenophobic agendas and securitization of border practices, um, the use of new technologies. There's already discussions about using things like uh, facial recognition technology, health screenings at borders for travelers in general, perhaps for the years to come, um, and uh, talks about immunity passports. Uh, these bring up very, very, uh, I think, concerning um, uh, uh, concerning frameworks for the future of uh, looking at the protections of civil liberties and rights for all people, but particularly for those who are already marginalized. Um, I think, uh, as you said, um, you know, all these things are happening in the United States, uh, to use a no pun intended, but we're not immune uh, to these uh, abuses here. And, uh, you know, as far as uh, President Trump's treatment of um, refugees at the border, families, children being held in detention, even while uh, they're at, at huge risk of, of contagion and um, dying. Um, and uh, so there's there's a lot of um, very important issues and they will continue because the crisis uh, will be bouncing around the world uh, probably in the months and perhaps years to come. And so this is uh, changing the landscape entirely. Um, we see that people are taking advantage of this uh, moment of weakness and will attack democracy, will attack um, uh, minorities um, to gain advantage. Um, and we are all at very much ri at, at risk uh, now for losing our rights. Uh, perhaps contact tracing is necessary. It's something that needs to be discussed, but what will be the safeguards that will prevent that from being misused? Uh, hearing from Sana about uh, how that uh, uh, Muslim community is being blamed for the contagion. Um, the contagion in that case is really xenophobia spreading um, and fear. Um, and, uh, and that serves uh, the purposes of certain powers that be. Um, but um, so it's, it's going to be a major uh, challenge for us all um, to uh, connect and to build our uh, working relationships, whether it's at the UN and, you know, maybe sometimes we, many people feel the UN is not always uh, that successful in what it does, um, but it's so complex as far as um, the many levels uh, of action, some of it uh, very much behind the scenes, um, compacts uh, on migration, perhaps don't include Inter internally displaced people, as, as Mon Ami was saying, uh, because we run into the sovereignty issue. Um, but yet the conversation is ongoing and there are a lot of um, efforts to move resources and personnel to where it's needed. Um, and I think that uh, your role, Mon Ami, to bring civil society into engagement 
with those huge structures, with UNHCR, with um, IOM, with other uh, refugee services, um, is is so important. Um, so the international community, you know, will struggle uh, to gain trust and gain traction in the coming months uh, on this particular issue. Um, I see a, we have a question um, from uh, two two questions, and I'm just going to read them because Sana sort of responded here on text. Um, Abdul writes, I was wondering if you could respond to what is happening to corona patients in Indian hospitals. The news are that patients are segregated on religious basis. And Sana responded, there is segregation of patients between Hindus and Muslims at a hospital in Ahmedabad, Gujarat. What is happening rampantly throughout the country are Muslims being denied treatment. So that's certainly huge. Uh, Sana, did you want to uh, just weigh in briefly on that? Yeah, I don't. Can you hear me? Yes. OK, um, I don't think I can underscore that enough that um, the situation right now in India is genocidal. Um, there are people dying throughout the country um, that are not receiving treatment for very basic um, issues. And COVID patients um, that are Muslim um, a majority of them that uh, were have been quarantined, um, uh, but uh, I guess, yeah, again, I think that uh, the major issue is, and I can't stress it enough, is that medical treatment is being denied to Muslims because there is this association with coronavirus and Muslims in India, and, um, and there's great fear in reporting these situations. All of the news stories that we're hearing are from people that have been brave enough to report these stories in the face of CAA, in the face of becoming um, stateless. Uh, the situation is, is terrifying. Um, but in terms of, of COVID patients, um, COVID patients are being dealt with. Uh, however, in, in terms of the greater issue is uh, the COVID branded Islamophobia that's emerged out of this. Um, yeah. I, you know, Sana, I, I, I don't know if this has uh, happened on the same level in Burma, but of course, the Rohingya have been stigmatized and made stateless over you know many decades. And um, certainly there's the risk that uh, in Burma, the same dynamic will take hold. Um, and so um, already uh, the Rohingya Muslim minority uh, lacks uh, much access uh, to medical care at all. And we just don't, aren't hearing the news because uh, the government has um, instituted uh, an internet and cell phone ban on certain areas of Northern Rakhine State. Um, unfortunately, similar government uh, policies impact Rohingya in the refugee camps in Bangladesh, at least, you know, as far as internet and cell phone access. So this is a black hole as far as reporting, and we we rely on people's, uh, you know, access to uh, the field, And um, but we're very concerned uh, about what's happening and isn't being reported. Um, as far as um, going back to the environment, you know, we talked a bit about xenophobia, and this is a huge factor, uh, but then also again the profit motive um, behind these uh, this device of politics. Um, global warming and climate change and so forth are going to be huge issues in the coming decades. And as far as bringing John John back into the conversation, you know um, the the uh, younger people who are um, trying to prevent their future from being even even more disastrous um, are uh, trying to raise awareness about what we have to do to prevent climate change. And uh, right now, there are very few airplanes flying, or at least uh, you know for uh, travel. Um, and perhaps there is some um, improvement in the air quality, and perhaps some of the development projects that would be uh, destructive to the environment are not going forward at the moment. 
it's unclear whether we're going to learn the right uh, lessons from this crisis. Um, and uh, I was wondering if you had any thoughts about, you know, lessons, um, ways that you see us working together to prevent the scapegoating of minorities and promote unity uh, in the face of these major challenges to our entire humanity. Yeah, I think it's just really important to, you know, first and foremost, just focus on how this issue will affect everyone, not just ethnic minorities, you know, because like, um, for people in Burma, um, I guess it's easy for the Burmese military to get away with whatever they're doing, with the profits they're raking in. But when there's awareness being raised about like how these issues will affect literally everyone in the entire country, um, not just the poor, the IDPs, the refugees, the poor and the rich, but like, yeah, everyone's gonna be affected by this. And I think unless this awareness is being raised in the country, like no one's really gonna care um, because they just think it's, you know, it has nothing to do with them. And it's just something that's far off in the distant future. But yeah, it's happening right now at this moment. Um, and with, especially with the coronavirus epidemic pandemic going on, um, it, it just gives even more reason for the Burmese military to act up and continue committing even more genocide because the news, the TV, you know, the, like the coronavirus is always on the news right now. And like, that's, you know, that's what the world is only paying attention to. So it just allows them to get away with even more acts of genocide. Um, so, yeah. Um, I just posted uh, the website for my group, uh, justiceforall.org which has links to Burma Task Force and Save uh, Uyghur and the other programs that we have uh, on India and Kashmir. Um, the, uh, I was wondering very briefly if any of the other speakers have some concrete suggestions for the listeners uh, to take action. We have um, action alerts every week, pretty much, um, often asking uh, people to reach out to elected officials, on the Hill or in the UN or elsewhere um, in the media uh, to raise awareness in, in strategic ways. But how about your own group? What do you think we can do in the short term? What kind of action can people take? And anyone who wants to jump in. So I guess I'll just share quickly from Stand. Um, I am uh, the co-lead of the Burma committee within that. And um, for this committee, we're basically just having this campaign going on right now where um, it's called IDPs are like me. And I'm just asking like, you know, students to send in videos of themselves. I have a whole script written out already. And they, all they have to do is just like uh, read off of that script uh, while videotaping themselves, saying that they stand in solidarity, solidarity with um, IDPs in Burma. And afterwards, um, uh, they just ask their senators um, to co-sponsor the Burma Human Rights and Freedom Act of 2019 in order for these tragic events to stop happening. So it's just tackling right at the root issue. It would be great if you could type in the uh, link maybe on the uh, chat on the side. That would be helpful. Yeah, um, sure. I can um, type in the link for the Stan website. Mm -hmm. So that um, any people here who have like you know connection with students or like family members who are young people like to visit the website. Great, um, Sana or Monami. Would you like to make any uh, last suggestions as far as action steps? Um, sure, I can say a few comments. Um, I posted a few resources in the chat box, and I just want to point out one of them, which I'll uh, post here again. Uh, there's a, uh, a global uh, network called the Civil Society Action Committee on Migration. Um, and they've uh, really did a comprehensive sort of mapping of the impacts of COVID-19 on migrants and some of the uh, practices that are happening both in a negative way and also some promising initiatives that governments may be taking at local levels uh, that that should be replicated and they're also calling out calling for a sign-on 
to this and, and it could be used as an advocacy tool in your own countries. Um, so we work closely with the Civil Society Action Committee. It includes hundreds of uh, migrant rights and refugee group organizations around the world. So I just reposted that. Um, an another one I would say if is any of you are working on issues of people in detention, um, the International Detention Coalition is also a terrific international network that works around the rights of detainees and for alternatives to detention. And they did a series of listening sessions um, of groups around the world and they're oh mapping yeah. what's happening with detainees um, in uh, different countries and they're also similarly created a website as a very concrete advocacy tool for those who are advocating to get people outside out of detention at this moment uh, and in general. So I, I posted that as well. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, email me, uh, put that earlier to join the listening sessions. Um, and again, we're trying to turn these conversations into concrete, practical policy guidance that civil society can use. And then of course the UN uh, would be working with governments to try to have them do the right thing uh, in terms of protecting the human rights and um, basic service access and uh, protections for, for all people, regardless of their migration status, ethnicity, race, and religion. Thanks. Um, and Sana, a couple of action steps for people to take. So yeah, um, we would uh, like everybody to, um, if you're a part of any sort of grassroots organization to um, especially related to, um, uh, sorry, organizing and uh, migration issues to uh, issue in a statement about the, um, the situation unfolding in India. We, this is the time where we need international solidarity uh, from all groups, in fact, it's um, groups focused on migration, but groups focused on human rights um, from all over the world to um, really let that share with the world that uh, their concern for the issues unfolding in India as they will have regional and global consequences. Um, and that is what we really urge everybody to do. You can also follow um, our action alerts with IAMC Council. Um, IAMC.com or um, on Twitter at IAMC Council. I can put that in the, the links here in the chat. That's great. I mean, now during the crisis, uh, ongoing crisis, some people are volunteering and delivering food to the elderly or other people who are unable to get out. Um, there's a lot of opportunities to volunteer. Uh, those who are, are uh, able to uh, get involved in organizing on behalf of of some of the most vulnerable people now, the refugees and displaced people, the, the migrants of the world. Um, you know, we didn't talk much about the United States, but um, we're certainly included. There's a lot of have-nots here for sure, um, and uh, and people who are marginalized. Um, so, how do we partner with them? You know, that that means um, getting involved with some of these uh, coalitions, and hopefully, we can find a way to. Uh, not just feel bad about the situation, but take action. There's a lot of, of, of needs now. Um, so I, I know that one of the, uh, the greatest uh, organizers is with us, um, uh, Chump Tali Hawk, who's uh, uh, hosting us here uh, today, this conversation, and want to invite Chump Tali back to, to finish us up today. Uh, but I really appreciate having the opportunity to have this conversation. And hopefully we can take some steps, um, some action steps uh, together. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you so much. I, I, I think I always, um, typically I'm the moderator, and I often don't time, have the time to sort of sit back and listen. And this was a phenomenal panel. I want to thank, first of all, our guests, um, Monami Janja and Sanodin. Um, to be present and uh, and most definitely to Adam Carroll, who I've known for many years uh, at, uh, as being both a grassroots organizer, but one who has a very clear perception about um, how the global impacts the local. And so I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, this conversation, uh, which will be available on our Facebook page as well as YouTube. Um, 
use them as well. Use our content uh, for your also uh, education. And um, I also want just to remind folks that um, part of Law at the Margin's mission is to be the platform uh, for and a hub for social justice movements, so folks to come together and talk about strategies and talk about uh, concrete actions. So we are here. Um, this webinar came about because Adam reached out and said, can you host? And I said, yes. Uh, and so if anyone who's listening, who's on the chat, uh, wants to um, collaborate, to have a webinar, and there's other kinds of ways in which we use um, the media platform to get our issues out there. Um, we are more than happy um, to do that. And so I, I invite all of us. I think uh, we cannot do this alone. Uh, and so we have to really work uh, together. Um, I want to give, uh, I also want to just kind of do a little plug. Um, you know, we're primarily a volunteer based effort, um, but we do have costs. And so if you feel so inclined, um, you know, support our work. Um, our work basically goes into supporting grassroots um, organizers and organizations. Uh, and I'll put a link on the chat box about where you can support us. Uh, you can support us in kind. Come and be a speaker. Uh, none of our speakers uh, have given generously of their time. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's no honorariums, nothing fancy. Um, and so come as a speaker, write for us. Um, help us or coordinate programs um, so we can get the content out there. So there are many ways to contribute uh, that doesn't necessarily involve um, making a monetary donation, but of course we always uh, appreciate that as well. And then finally, um, no program would be possible without our senior tech producer, Albert Garcia. You don't see him, he's behind the scenes. He also helps with a lot of these webinars. And then finally, um, Please, a big shout out to Morgan Moon. Uh, if you go into our Twitter, at Law at the Margins, and you use the hashtag Solidarity and Survival, you will see uh, an, a phenomenal a recast of our program, which we will put up on our website. So again, um, I think part of our mission is to make this information available out there for social justice activists. And I'm, I'm completely in, in deep gratitude to all of you for the work that you do. With that, uh, we're going to sign off today. And, um, and if you, I'll post um, our email on the chat. Be in conversation with us. Let's continue to build on this program. Uh, we've uh, done a prior program before on specifically on Burma with Adam. We've written on the Rohingya genocide. Uh, we've written on the impact of the gen uh, on globalization on indigenous women, and we want to keep a focus on uh, on that as well. So please, um, we invite you to collaborate with us. Um, again, have a great rest of the day, morning, evening, whichever time zone that you're in, and um, solidarity. Thank you, Shantoli. Thank you, Adam.